Hello and welcome to Self-Sufficient Conversations. I'm your host, Natalie, and we're going to be speaking with my husband, Paul, today about our journey to self-sufficiency and permaculture. First, I really wanted to touch on our journey to permaculture because I had never heard of permaculture until I met Paul, and it was only until after our honeymoon around Australia when we came back and decided that we wanted to work towards self-sufficiency that he actually told me about this term before and what it meant. So how did you find out about permaculture? Um, growing up with my parents, obviously, I was going to say starting in a rural property, but it actually probably started in suburbia. Um, we had fig trees in the backyard with chooks running underneath them, um, a small veggie plot, but nothing serious. And the passion grew for my parents as they used to, my dad used to work as a landscaper and then went to the shearing sheds after that and was always traveling out to the country and fell in love with this spot about an hour's north of Perth, West Australia, and moved to this rural location and from there went with my parents visiting permaculture open days and, um, and I suppose I just got more and more involved with it. It wasn't so much back then, it wasn't a, a huge focus on, on perm culture as such, but it was common sense gardening. So everything had more than one purpose. Um, I remember there was lots of tire ponds and keyhole beds and uh, round earth houses. And even as a young, what was I, you know, 10, 14, 10 to 14 year old, um, it, it stuck with me. It wasn't a boring getting dragged around, kicking and screaming. I actually enjoyed seeing all these different gardens and different houses. And uh, if it was up to Dad, he would have had the whole 24-acre farm landscaped. But um, I think Mum pulled the reins in a bit and he had a nice strip out the side of the, I suppose it was out the front of the house, about 30 metres long by about 15 metres wide which was veggie garden, but it wasn't market garden style. They were thinking rows and, and planned out. It was more willy-nilly, you know, a zucchini plant here and a, and a palm tree there and uh, robolinis here and a nice little bridge going over a, a pond. And um, yeah, it was just all tied together. It was really pretty with rock paths and um, a little fernery off to the side, which was mum's spot to grow her ferns and stuff. So it wasn't just a production garden of just veggies. It was it was a very pretty garden. So for me, when we first met, we started talking about purchasing a farm and raising a family on a farm. And that ideal was never to be fully self-sufficient. There would have 100% been a veggie patch, but it would have been, you know, back then when we were thinking, it would have been like a small little backyard patch where you could harvest a couple of things here and there. Um, but it wasn't until our trip around Australia, um, we got to WA, we got to the wheat belt of WA where Paul grew up, which is probably like one of the furthest spots you could get from our home. And um, we popped in to see his mate there and um, they were living pretty self-sufficiently um, because they were so far out of town. I think that was the main reasoning there. Um, but they had a huge veggie patch. They reared all their own meat. They had a heap of chickens. And it was there that um, I was taught about GM seeds and heirloom seeds. I'd never heard these terms before. I was, I had just turned 22. We, <laughs> we got married when I had just turned 21. So I was fairly young, um, hadn't explored much of this area before. I was always interested in it. It always sparked um, my creativity and my interest, but it's not something I researched in depth. I just did you know, as my mum did, I followed along with her guidance, you know, saw what she did, copied, um, but there was never any in-depth research into why and how or what I was doing. So we learned about GM seeds and, and heirloom seeds. So as soon as we got back, which was a couple of months after that, um, we signed up to the Diggers Club, which is a huge um, Australian catalogue for heirloom seeds. It was one of the only ones um, around at the time. There were a few others, but the Diggers Club is the most well-known um, and most accessible to backyard farmers, I reckon, back in that, um, you know, mm. how long ago was that? 
13, 12 years ago. Um, and we bought a heap of seeds and we started playing around in our backyard. Um, our backyard was Western facing, which was uh, a huge mistake, but again, had no idea about anything like observe and aspect and yeah. Um, so we had this slopey property and this house was Western facing. So in winter, we didn't get sun until 1 p.m. And the backyard was full of gum trees and just wasn't ideal sun wise. Um, <laughs> but we tried and we had a veggie patch there. We had chooks there and we gave it a go. <laughs> it was at this property. I remember sitting in our study and um, sitting on the floor sorting through some paperwork. And I remember Paul coming in we started talking about permaculture and he started talking about this um, little aqua book that his dad had as introduction to permaculture by bill mollison so it's the one that was written after permaculture one i believe um which is where david holmgren had started that as his thesis i think it was his thesis back at the university of tasmania when he was studying under bill mollison and so he'd been talking about this book for 10 years and i finally got hold of this book um just before we moved um and we well i had heard the term permaculture was interested in permaculture, did a little bit of research, not much. It was only until just before I moved that I really dived deep into it um, headfirst, um, learning about the principles and all that. And then it wasn't until 2020 when I did my PDC that, um, yeah, everything kind of was fully immersed. Everything came together, everything that we've been immersing ourselves in over the last um, 12 years um, really came together full circle and this made a whole lot of sense um with what we we're doing um, mm. yeah but self-sufficiency for me became really important after that trip and learning you know that's that little spark of gm seeds and digging deeper into how industrialized foods are um, grown and processed um, and even working on a couple of farms on our journey around australia seeing what they do um, and uh, being impacted by those chemicals. I had terrible dermatitis after working on a strawberry picking farm and an avocado packing shed. Um, I had to wear double gloves. I had to wear cotton gloves. Actually, the avocado packing shed, we had to legally, well, I don't, don't know if it was legally, but the company policy was cotton gloves, then gloves on top to be handling the avocados. And the strawberry place, I used to just, and I'm not allergic to anything ever, nowhere, apart from mosquitoes. <laughs> um, but picking strawberries made me so itchy and it's because they used to pump on the chemicals um, so that's why self-sufficiency was really important for me after we had our first son we went organic and I started really looking into ingredients and chemicals not only in our food but cleaning agents and we just went down this natural path and it just kept you know becoming narrower and narrower to what is acceptable to us yeah and for me self-sufficiency was just it was kind of common sense like we're here on a on a beautiful farm why not grow our own produce and and stop supporting the big guys and you know the, a lot of the big shops screw down the farmers and they don't look after the farmers obviously they they just want the money in their pockets um but it was more just about being able to grow your own fruit and veg and oh I forgot to buy carrots or something you just walk out the backyard and, and pick your own carrots and, and it was just the way I grew up so it was kind of second nature and it was what I thought life was going to be so it's just amazing to see this all coming to fulfillment um, yeah I think it's just a, an amazing lifestyle and mm. um, what would be your biggest tip for beginners wanting to start a self-sufficient lifestyle or a permaculture lifestyle they are fairly different so when you talk about self-sufficiency and permaculture two totally different things usually if you're into permaculture you want some sort of self-sufficiency or self-resilience self-reliance that's kind of one of the principles there in permaculture but um, self-sufficiency doesn't necessarily mean um, permaculture you can be self-sufficient yeah. using so many different garden methods um, yeah you know there's back to Eden there's a no dig there's lasagna there's tilling there's no tilling there's <laughs> do it whatever way you want um permaculture pretty much the same look permaculture doesn't really advocate for tilling or digging um 
maybe some people do, but fairly, fairly more often than not, it's no dig, right? Um, but these two lifestyles are fairly different, but can sometimes interlink. So, um, biggest tip for a beginner. Um, as a lot of people say, just get started somewhere. It's not as big and as scary as it can look if you've never grown anything. Even if you're just going to go down and buy some seedlings from your local nursery and, and watch them grow and produce food, or even if it's not food, if it's flowers or whatever it may be, is just to, to get some roots in the soil and, and watch something grow and flourish. And There's something peaceful about walking through a garden and, and seeing things that you've created, colours and lines and contours and... And, and growth and food and food is an amazing thing just to watch grow from a, a little seed or a little seedling to this thing that you can put on your plate and eat at night is um, is very fulfilling so yeah just just to get started somewhere and not to get caught up in large scale it doesn't have to be huge it doesn't have to be a farm you know I know plenty of places that, that do it in suburbia that grow enough for a family to survive on a normal suburban block. It's just about planting smartly, um, yeah, whether it's stacking plants or even down to aquaculture and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, getting started somewhere and not being scared of failing and just, yeah. For me, my biggest tips would be firstly to observe very hard, especially if you're really passionate and really excited. For me, it was really hard to um, stop and observe here and I didn't do that, let's be honest. Uh, I just dove straight in. Um, very lucky that the infrastructure that I implemented was all sound. Um, it could have not been. Um, my veggie patch, my large veggie patch is in the right position, um, not only on the slope, but sun aspect wise. Um, no shade, no trees around it that's going to suck up the moisture, etc. Um, so observing is really important and if you don't want to observe, having the knowledge, um, because as a permaculture designer, um, you don't get to go to someone's farm and go, I'm going to sit here for a year and see what happens. Like you don't have that luxury. So as a permaculture, as a permaculture designer, you get a property and you need to look at it on a map. Sometimes you don't even get to visit it. And you need to go, well, this is going to be shaded. This is not going to be shaded. This gets more water. This is drier, et cetera, et cetera. So if you don't want to observe, um, having the knowledge and the foresight to go, well, this area is going to get shaded in winter. This area is going to be really wet in winter. This area might be really dry in summer, might be really windy in this spot. Um, and that way you can smartly plan your garden so that it's not going to be adversely affected because... A garden is affected by wind. We have a very windy site here. There's not much we can do about it. There's nowhere <laughs> that's sheltered from the wind. So um, I have to plant a windbreak. But um, if you are on a property that might have a more of a sheltered area, and there are properties that have that um, luxury, then you can plan around that. Um, another thing would be just give it a go. Um, learn if you want to move to a farm but you kind of feel stuck in suburbia use that time in suburbia to learn research and grow mm. so for us we were in suburbia for nine years before we moved to the farm and um, I took those nine years to play in my gardens um, learn in them um, I took that time to read as many books as I could and I think I borrowed every gardening book I possibly could from my local library um, I took that time to watch YouTube videos and documentaries on how things are grown industrially and how people have stepped away from that lifestyle and become self-sufficient. I was inspired by their story. I was inspired with how they did it. I cherry-picked things that really suited me, that have really um, resonated with me, and I applied them to my life, um, not only in suburbia but here on the farm. So. Um, there's so many ways that you can take steps to, become, to becoming self-sufficient. It doesn't happen overnight. You don't just make a decision to be self-sufficient and all of a sudden you've got all your own food. For us, it took nine years, actually longer, 10, 11 years, to be confidently self-sufficient. With coronavirus, you know, we're locked down for another five days now, coming into effect um, last night, midnight, 
we can't leave for five days. I can confidently not leave my home and still feed my family good nutritious food because it's all produced here on the farm. It's a closed loop um, and um, it, it just it, it encompasses everything um, that we need. There's things that we would like, like spices and salt and sugar and vinegar and chocolate that we can't produce here, but I can certainly live without those. Maybe not chocolate, but I could try. <laughs> <laughs> We're growing carrot. Maybe we could do something with it. <laughs> Maybe, but no. <laughs> um, so for me, definitely observe, give it a go, no matter where you are. Start your learning journey because your learning journey is forever. Um, my learning journey has certainly only just begun. Um, and if, you are already growing and you're like, oh my God, this is really sucking because it certainly goes through those phases. <laughs> um, for me, the biggest game changer in my garden was hot compost. Um, I had no topsoil in my veggie patch and um, really struggled to grow a lot of stunted plants, not a great yield in them. And um, just by putting a, putting a nice layer of hot compost on there with mulch, 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 um, mulch. <laughs> has changed my garden from mediocre to phenomenal and it's only ever it's only going to improve if i'm going to continue to add that organic matter so they're probably my biggest tips is let's go over them again because they are so important for me is um, observe research learn hot compost and mulch five of my tips yes definitely mulch <laughs> i'm saying bear Bare soil here that either gets eroded or full of weeds um, or just doesn't produce the topsoil washes away and just a hard clay pan underneath. And um, with these areas in the garden that we've built up, we've layered on the mulch thick as possible, thick as we could possibly get our hands on it. And it's made such a difference. It breaks down into beautiful soil, it covers the soil, it keeps it cool in summer, that brings the worms to the top so they can do their job. Um, keeps the microbes alive. Yeah, yeah, keeps the microbes alive. It's just amazing. And you know, even in some of the windiest days, we'll put down um, hay or straw. Hopefully, the best we can get is straw. <laughs> and it doesn't blow away, it just sort of mats together. And it's been pretty amazing how it's withheld some pretty strong winds. So, yeah, being mulch, mulch, mulch is another one of my big tips. And another thing I want to talk about with self sufficiency is. When we moved here, to, when we moved here to the farm, the, the dream was to be self-sufficient. So I think it was our first spring and I was like, we're going to do this challenge and we're going to be self-sufficient. Yay. And it was um, us growing all our own food. And that challenge lasted about four hours <laughs> because there wasn't much growing in the garden at that stage. And I wasn't allowing the flexibility um, of what self-sufficiency is. Self-sufficiency is never you doing it yourself. Self-sufficiency is so much more than you just growing your own food. So fast forward to another year, um, spring 2019, it was September, and I decided that I wanted to do this challenge again, but I changed it up. And so the challenge was then, eat what we grow, eat what we forage, eat what we barter for. Bartering is such a huge part of self-sufficiency. You can grow amazing carrots, but your neighbor can't, but they can grow amazing cabbages and you can't. Hey, swap. Yes. So bartering is huge. And, um, and then I wanted to add in something else because I wanted the pantry staples. I am a cook. I enjoy cooking. I enjoy good food and I enjoy good flavors. So I needed spices. I needed grains and legumes and sugar and vinegar and chocolate and coffee and those little, little bits of luxury. But how could I achieve that without growing it? Because I can't grow coconuts here. I can't grow um, a lot of the spices here. So I can grow amazing garlic here because I'm in a cool temperate climate. So why not grow crap loads of that in winter when not much else is happening in my garden? Mm. Sell that and use that towards building my pantry. And so my garden is still funding what we're eating. Um... I'm not a commercial farmer, but my garden is providing our family with those little extra bits that we can't grow ourselves. There are so many foods that you can forage. It depends where you live, but down here in Victoria in the cool temperate climate, we can forage mushrooms and blackberries and peaches and apples. 
um, chestnuts in areas. You've got weeds, deer, plums. fish, plums, um, freshwater fish, saltwater fish. Gosh, the, the list is endless. We found a peach tree on the side of the road, like on the side of the freeway, not even just a road. And mm. it produces the most amazing peaches. Um, but that takes the pressure off me and my space. Why grow greens in a really small plot if you've only got a really small plot when you can walk down to the park and forage wild greens? Like don't take up space in your on your property if you don't need to. There are lily pillies that you can um, harvest and heaps of other wild foods like um, prickly currants. They don't fill you up, but they're a little something, a little bit of fun that you can forage in the bush. Um, and just opening your eyes when you're driving around town and your suburbs, obviously don't nick your neighbor's food. Like that's not cool. Don't do it. Um, if there's a tree behind a fence, it's not yours to pick from. That's common sense, but sometimes people don't have common sense, but I thought I'd reiterate that. Um, <laughs> if you really want the lemons that are overhanging and you see that they're on the floor, knock on someone's door and ask them. They're usually more than happy to share their surplus with you. Um, but just opening your eyes when you're driving around, there are so many wild apple trees around here. So many wild plum trees, damson plum trees. Um, it's just ridiculous the amount of food that's growing wild that people don't utilize. And people have driven past these how many times when they live in this area, yet they're not focused on that because it's not important to them. And then here we are with a car full of 300 kilos of apples because no one else wants them. Yes, please. So you don't need to do it all yourself. You can, um, you need your community around you to support you on this journey. And we have amazing friends. We've made amazing friends through this. Um, just because we didn't even, like we didn't even speak to them about it. It's just come up in conversation. Like mm. here, have a bag of apples because we found them and we're living this, challenge you know this this one year challenge where we're not buying any food from the supermarket do you have any relationships were sparked from that like it wasn't even we didn't even ask for anything they're just mm. like oh that's so cool can we be involved i've got this that's extra would you like some mm. and yeah it's just such an organic um relationship but that is what self-sufficiency is you need that relationship you need that community yeah definitely do you have anything else you want to add <laughs> um, no, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for joining us on this uh, episode of Self Sufficient Conversations. We will see you guys next week, and I'll be speaking with Annalise from NZ Homesteading. And she farms much like us. They are on Broad Acre, and they rear their own meat, and they do a lot of hunting. So it's really it's going to be a lot of fun to chat to her about that, and. When I recorded that episode, her um, heifer wasn't far off calving. I can confirm that she has had the calf and it's adorable. So I'll leave all her links in her video below so you can check out her adorable calf spam and her milking journey because this is the beginning of her um, first house cow, which is super exciting. Such a huge homestead goal for me. But thank you and we'll chat to you soon. Goodbye.